for me. Uh, may I also <coughs> acknowledge the presence of uh, the photo state, the media, yourselves. I should use this platform to once again express our sincere gratitude for the partnership that we have had as parliamentarians uh, and the media. I think through you we've been able to disseminate information to the outside, especially that we are operating under very difficult circumstances <coughs> where your area members of parliament are not able to speak in parliament. So when you come out here and cover us, sometimes this is the only way that our members of parliament have been able to communicate with other citizens, including the people in their constituencies. So I want to commend you for the work that you have put in so far in ensuring that um, you know, information reaches out. So before I talk uh, to what happened, uh, you know, that led to us walking out of the house, I thought it was very important uh, for me to also add to what Honorable Kampiongo just talked about. The careless statements that were made by the Foreign Affairs Minister yesterday, <coughs> where he alleged or constructively stated that uh, the Chinese were careless to lend to the PF government. That's very unfortunate. We challenged him on the floor of the house that now that they had an, occasion, uh, an opportunity to, meet, to, to visit uh, China, to understand the Chinese culture, to understand how the Chinese operate, how methodical the Chinese are. Not methodical. <laughs> yeah. Chinese are very methodical. They are very structured with what they do. So we're hoping that against all the early allegations on borrowing and other things, they now understood how Chinese work. You know, you just can't show up because you think you're head of state somewhere and you think Jinping is going to see you next moment. No. He will see you when, you know, he eh, 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 should you see you. It's no wonder, you know, eh, we, we saw you know, some of our visitors, our leaders, you know, being maybe only given two hours after being away for five hours. Chinese are structured. You know, it's not random. You don't show up at the gate with the motorcade and think they're going to, they're going to bend. Now, the point I'm trying to make there is we ask the Minister of Foreign Affairs, now that you understand the Chinese culture, now that you witnessed for yourself how Chinese work, is it to your position that the Chinese could have used the money for the people of China to give it or lend it <coughs> to another government carelessly? And he said yes. So we felt very, very, very uncomfortable. We thought the trip to China would have corrected some misaligned thinking that our friends the EPND had about China. China has been a long-standing friend of Zambia. China has helped Zambia in many ways. And the goodness between, the goodness with China, they come in on a win-win situation. Whilst other countries force us to embrace other cultures, other traditions, like LGBTQ, China believes in a win-win situation. When you have interacted with China, they engage you on an equal basis, such that at the end of your engagement, it's a win-win situation. It's no wonder you are all now pointing to Lusaka International Airport. It's no wonder you can point at Mulungushi International Conference Center. You point at Simon Mwansaka Puepue Airport, Hari Mwangangkumbula, visible projects. Yes. Can you go back? When you go back in time, for how long did it take us to come up with projects such as those? When you sit with the Chinese and agree, there will be 2,000 towers dotted right around the country. That's how sincere the Chinese are. For those 2,000 towers, the Chinese did not ask us to change our culture. They didn't say, no, now you start doing this. And, and, you know, and bring in LGBTQ and other things. No. For this Mulungushi are seeing here, they did not demand LGBTQ rights. For those airports, we didn't sign for LGBTQ. That's how sincere the Chinese are. We were hoping that despite delaying to go to China, now that the EPND, the delegation, 
presidential delegation went to China, they would actually understand how fair the Chinese are. The question is, with all that they have done for us, <coughs> did they deserve the comments from the Foreign Affairs Minister? Certainly not. We are extremely disturbed because we know what the Chinese have done for Zambia. Right now, we are all here. There's power. You know, you can leave lights running. There's no load shedding. Why? Because President Edgar Chagwalungu and the PF government engaged the Chinese. We increased our generation. We more than doubled it. Now there's no load shedding. Why? Because of the Chinese. But why should the Minister of Foreign Affairs talk about China and China's assistance like that? Can you honestly, sitting in Parliament, say we have not seen anything the Chinese money did when you're looking at Monongoshi, right in front of you? You only arrived yesterday, landed at an airport, and you say we have not seen anything. You go to your house, you switch on the lights because of the, the, the increased power generation. Your uncle is in with coal mine Soko, there is outer modern facilities there, and you say you have not seen anything that happened with the Chinese money? Is that fair? Have you seen how many police houses have been built countrywide? In thousands. My brother, well done. Mm. Well done. Yes. Well done, Honorable Campion. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go right across the country. You're going to see houses under Ministry of Home Affairs. Your area, your sector, ZNBC studios right across the country are there. The Chinese understood that in future there will be a problem with food. They gave us milling plants. The large scale, Mpika, Solwezi, Mongu, everywhere. President Daka in HM has been commissioning some of them. The smaller ones are dotted right across the country. Why? Because the Chinese were thinking about the poor Zambians. What others do not think about. What others think about is how they are going to get our lithium, how they are going to get our cobalt and get our copper, and do not care about what happens to people in the copper belt. The Chinese thought about the poor people in the rural areas design solar milling plants to ensure that we have cheaper milling. Mm. But why should the Minister of Foreign Affairs talk about the Chinese like that? We take great exception to those statements. We take offense as a matter of fact. Because the list is very long on what the Chinese have done for us. And I'll take this opportunity to apologize most sincerely to the Chinese and Chinese government on behalf of the PF and the PF MPs. That the words by the Foreign Affairs Minister should not be attributed to us, but the UPND. It's the UPND who think that the money that you brought to Zambia did not do anything, it disappeared in thin air, and you were careless when you lent the money to Zambia. It's not us. For us who borrowed the money from you, we want to say that we shall forever remain indebted to you for the true friendship that you showed in coming to assist us right across the sectors. The engagement with the Chinese to us was a real game changer. Whilst CDF is a real game changer to our friends, our real game changer was the engagement with the Chinese. That's what brought about airports. So I thought it was very important <coughs> for us to uh, tender our apology to the Chinese, to the Chinese ambassador, that the statements that he had on the floor of the house should not be attributed to every Zambian, every political party. They should be restricted to the UPND because that's what they believe. And I hope that their other friends that they respect can be of assistance to the magnitude that we got from the Chinese. I thought this was very, very important. And secondly, I think there, is a, there was an alarm that was raised, though it's being downplayed. Zambia National Farmers Union raised an alarm that there could be some fake fertilizers on the market being supplied. They were being very careful. They were being very careful. They are saying, let's investigate the efficacy of these fertilizers that are being distributed. It goes back to the same thing. The moment you want to manipulate the procurement process, we know that in 2021, we did not raise alarm. The people that were given contracts to supply fertilizer went outside to outsource and they had no mechanism to check the efficacy of the fertilizers. Honorable Mulenga, for we raised the point of order on the floor of the house because the crops in Chinubi and many other parts of the country were affected. <coughs> he was ignored. But the Zambia National Farmers Union have raised alarm 
So for us, we are not restricting that allegation to the small scale suppliers of fertilizers. We have to check the big players in this sector because this may contribute to the hunger situation within the country. So we want to urge government to immediately move in and test the fertilizers that are still awaiting distribution so that before they are given to our poor farmers, they should be checked for the, for, for the efficacy. I thought this too was very, very important uh, you know, uh, going forward. One of our campaigns we talked about foreigners uh, uh, you know, residing or resident within uh, the confines of power and state house that are influencing uh, government policy. Even budgeting. Even budgeting. The reason why you have failed to resonate with this budget, the reason why 50% of the UPND MPs were sleeping when the budget was being presented, a budget which was, which was supposed to be theirs, was because they could not resonate with it. It's some foreigner somewhere sitting at State House who influenced the formulation and the crafting of that budget. So when they were making that budget, they are not thinking about an average Zambia. So even the MPs, UPND MPs, are also tired. They showed, they showed the disconnection from that budget because it did not address what most of our, our people are facing. And uh, I thought that, um, you know, uh, our comrade uh, JJ Banda came out very strongly on this. Many other MPs that spoke on the floor of the House are demanding that uh, can we come up with local solutions, local policies, because the usual suspects that are seen walking around the corridors of power are the ones that are influencing you know, the budgeting uh, going forward. And uh, I think lastly, I want to say that uh, for the case of the Auditor General, uh, we demand that uh, he holds another press briefing where he declines that appointment, because that appointment is illegal. Uh, you, you know that um, the, there was a lot of talk, there was a question on the floor of the House asking Minister of Finance about the ministers that stayed in, you know, in office beyond their term. And uh, Comrade Sokotwane kept on talking about uh, uh, you know, government, uh, their government uh, uh, obeying the rule of law. We are surprised that he could even say that when the appointment of the 64-year-old Auditor General is still in effect. So we want to call upon uh, this Auditor General to say we will not rest Auditor General until you address the media again and tell them that now you have declined that appointment because you do not qualify. And for your own information, we are also writing to professional bodies to tell them that they have a member who is participating in the abrogation of the law. And those letters as early as next week will be dispatched. Because we do not want to sit back and entertain illegality happening in our face. So, colleagues, um, as my colleagues earlier commented, you all are witnesses. You witnessed how our parliament, parliamentary etiquette and decorum has collapsed. How our parliamentary democracy has collapsed. There is nothing, you know. You can imagine that sometimes when you just wake up and switch on your parliamentary TV, you, you know, you think you're watching a circus. Okay? Even for us who sit in that house many a time, we always look in disbelief to see what has happened to, 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 to our parliament. For some of us that were privileged to serve even earlier, you know, under other presiding officers, it's indeed a shame to see what this parliament has become. Now, when you look at the freedom of our members, our members are not free. I want to say this to presiding officers, starting from Madam Speaker, first Deputy Speaker, second Deputy Speaker. The members of Parliament that come are elected members of Parliament. Don't turn it into a prefect student arrangement. We feel so disrespected. These are elected members. You want to call upon an elected member and say, sit down. As if he's your child? To the presiding officer, I want to say this. In my capacity as leader of opposition, the lines have been drawn. We will no longer allow you presiding officers to abuse the members, nor disrespect them. 
The standing orders are very clear on how you address members of parliament. If you, the, if you, the presiding officers, are the first one to breach the standing orders, do you know what that means? Then the standing orders are at large. You cannot refer to the same standing orders when you want to discipline a member of parliament. If you disobey, you disrespect a member of parliament. A simple instruction, a simple request, one of member, please take your seat. That's respectful. You cannot be telling members of parliament every day, I'm warning you, I wish to warn you, sit down. No, no, no. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker, that should come to an end. That should come to an end. Lines have been drawn as members of parliament who will no longer take that disrespect. We will not take it anymore. This is the House of Members. You are mere umpires. Don't turn yourselves to be owners of that house. That's the house of the people. We are not strangers in that house. I will not come into that house at your mercy. I was elected by people of Mporokoso. The people of Blunte elected you. People of Kampinsa elected you, the owners of the house. The people of Chinubi elected you. Bakampion. It's the people of Shuangandu that elected you. Yeah. The people of Lukasha elected you. Absolutely. You don't come to this house and people say, sit down, member of Lukasha. Because the speaker does not like the way you're looking that day. They think there's no point that you to speak. No, 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 no. I want to make one solemn undertaking. We will not take that anymore. I'm afraid we will not take that anymore. We are ready to pay the consequences. We are ready to be punished a thousand times. We will not stop until the House begins to operate as a normal parliament. Not anymore. We have tolerated for too long. Two years is long enough. People get certificates and diplomas in two years. Why can't Moyo for once learn how to handle the House? Who will not allow Moyo to become a champion in that House? We are de I am declaring war against Moyo. Moyo, you will not have it easy in that House. I am ready, like I say, to face the consequences. But not allow Moyo to destroy the house. It's about the country. This is about the country. We will not be mistreated by this incompetent presiding officer called Moyo. And we sit back and allow it? I will not sit back. His incompetence is obvious. His incompetence is obvious. All of you know that. The fact that you've been quiet, we allowed him time to learn. But now, we do not want Moyo to preside in that house. We demand that Moyo is removed as Speaker of that house. Because he is reducing the decorum and etiquette of that house. We, the representatives of the people, can no longer sit back and watch Moyo, Moses Moyo, destroy this parliament. The message to Moyo is that you are not fit to run that parliament. Moyo you are incompetent and cannot continue to preside over the affairs of that house. Moyo, I want to promise you, until you are able to run that house properly, I will be on your case. We can't allow Moyo to destroy that house. Moyo should be stopped from misbehaving in that house. Yeah. Why should it be about Moyo? Yeah. Who is Moyo? Just a referee. He's just a referee, he's just an umpire. Yeah. We are elected what, what, members of parliament. Why should, mm. Why should Moyo be the almighty? Why should Moyo be omnipotent? Yeah. That will not allow. I'm afraid, countrymen and women, we want to bring and restore order back to parliament. We want presiding officers to understand their space, <coughs> operate within their space, respect is end, and we want there to be mutual respect between us and presiding officers. Presiding officers must be reminded these are elected members of parliament. They are not their children. They are not their students. So to be able to manage leaders, there is some decorum, some ethics that you should be able to observe. You will not tell a member, sit down, I'm warning you. Warning who? I didn't come to that parliament to be warned. Why should you warn me? Just follow, read out the standing orders. Standing orders, honorable member, you're out of order. That is a language. The language in the standing order should not be modified. The fact that we know 
to say state house has a, has a heavy hand on this parliament. Mm. We are also warning those who are coming from state house to, ha to have a heavy hand upon this parliament to influence those that are, that are managing this parliament. We are all equally warning them. This is a democracy. It is a constitutional democracy. We must operate within the confines of the law. We will resist any temptation by those that will put in offices to try and abuse us, to try and intimidate us. Do we look like people that can be intimidated? Do we appear like cowards to you? So they must be told. Just look, for instance, uh, at one provision, uh, Standing Order 134. If you read Standing Order 135, it provides the criteria for raising a uh, matter of urgent public importance. Very clear cut. But the presiding officers have designed their own criteria. <laughs> no matter of life and death. And yet, anything that would require government's response is deemed to be a matter of urgent public importance. So for me, I'm saying, the moment you ignore the standing orders, like our, our presiding officers have been doing, standing orders are attached. You, you can't rely on them. From the time we opened this parliament, there's been over 1,000 agent matters of public importance. I think five only have been admitted. And because the speaker, whoever was presiding that day, liked what was being talked about. So not, we can't live like that. We are saying, as your representatives, we are making one statement, that the abuse in the House mark this day. This be the last day. We've drawn our lines. We will fight in that house until those that are managing that house can align themselves and begin to behave in conformity with our standing orders. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I thought that was very, very important that uh, we can't allow uh, the executive. If you go and check the committees like we commented last time, they are now providing checks and balances upon themselves because they chose themselves it was uh, Moyo himself uh, and uh, uh, Honorable Stafford Mulusa and uh, Sage, the young man in the Speaker's office. They are the ones that were putting pressure on those that craft the committees. Can you imagine that? They made committees, they are talking to our members as a reward system. We want you to come and help us maybe during constitutional amendment. Corrupting members, I'll put you in a lucrative committee. Please vote with us, come with us. We know all these machinations and want to expose them. <clears throat> so because of that, they compromised all those committees, oversight committees. It's the UPND who are providing oversight upon themselves. When we tried to correct those ills, we were ignored. Yesterday, the other day, the quorum almost collapsed because the committees were sitting in the afternoon. Those committees that were picked, where they chose themselves, were sitting in the afternoon. <laughs> and they found themselves, there was no UPND in their benches because they were in those committees to expose themselves even further. So even the composition of committees, we are going to start an active fight. This is a message to the clerk that uh, if you look at the select committee, there is only one chairperson, so it's like a standing select committee. A select committee which is supposed to have several members, you know, taking chairmanship and the composition, it's the same. The delegation in the Madam Speaker, in Madam Speaker's delegation, is the same people. What kind of parliament are we running? So I want to say this to the clerk, that these are issues now we'll be dealing with every day. We allowed you, we were civil enough to allow you to get out with some of these things. Now we have drawn the line. We'll call you out as it is. We are looking at the delegation, the justification to have the same delegation accompany Madam Speaker wherever she goes. Why can't that change? What's so special about those people? The select committee, what's so special about those people? And the selection of standing committees, which was done by Moses Moyo, <laughs> Stafford Molusa, and Sage, the young man Sage that works in the Speaker's office. We will not sweep any, any debt under the carpet anymore. We will confront you with the truth as it comes to us so that this parliament can be realigned. We can't allow this uh, dignified house to be, to be turned into some little farmhouse can't embarrass, uh, sort of arrangement. So we'll correct all the ills starting from today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, the position was on fire today. I'm sure he has exhausted a lot of issues.